Hi guys, welcome to our guided notes section on introduction to unit five. So this video is going to introduce you to the exponential models that we use in skill one. And then our next video will actually cover skill one. So this video really serves more as an introduction. There's a lot of inform information and facets we need to wrap our head around with these exponential models before we can start graphing with transformations. So first I thought we would start by looking at the trend of the coronavirus data that we saw in our Desmos activity over the past couple days. And if you can think back um, to what the shape of the graph looked like when we plotted the points, it kind of made sort of this general type shape here that when you fit a graph to it kind of goes like this. So it's a graph that's basically strictly increasing and in the beginning is not increasing very fast. In fact, it has kind of a slow rate, but then sort of somewhere right around here, the rate begins to speed up, you know, and grow exponentially, right, is the word that we use for that. So this is kind of the general shape of this type of data. And um, the spread of a disease is not the only type of exponential growth. It is one of the more well-known types, um, but there's also population growth, um, bacteria growth, uh, things like that tend to follow models that kind of look like this. Starts off slow at first and then increases really, really fast. So we needed a model, we needed a type of function that could help us model that type of spread or growth. And the word we use for that is exponential. But I wanted to kind of look at some of the, or two of the other models that we've worked a lot with this year. And the first one is linear and the second one is quadratic. It helps to kind of go back and say, well, why do we need a new function? Why aren't the functions we've learned about before sufficient in this case? So I thought I would kind of take a look at um, some of your Desmos work to kind of show you or illustrate it for you. Let's just take a look. Don't worry, I've anonymized the name so no one can tell who I'm referring to. So I believe the slide where you compared was slide 10. So maybe I'll pick this one here. This is done very well, whoever this was, very nice job. Okay, so I'm gonna just take the other models off that this person had. I'll take off the exponential model and I'll take off the quadratic model and let's just take a look. So here's the data here. Um, so here's the linear model that would best fit this data. This is the best fitting line here. Um, and you can see it does not reflect the data very much at all, except for like this point here and that point there. You know, it would be a good predictor for um, day six, six days after February 20th. It'd be a good predictor for 19 days after February 20th, but that's it. Um, it's way too high here for all of these earlier dates and then it's way too low over here for all of these later dates. So, and that is because the major pitfall with linears is that it's a constant rate of change. It's just the Y value keeps going up the same amount for each X that it goes over. So it's like a constant rate of change. And that is just not the case with these dots, right? These dots have a very slow rate of change in the beginning and then a very, very fast rate of change toward the end. So the linear model is not able to give us a good predictor of future values. It's just too slow of a growth. But then the other pitfall for linear is it goes into the negatives, right? We need something that's gonna help us flatten out at the beginning, right? Show us something that's really low and flat, but not necessarily negative, something that would kind of end at zero and not go into the negatives. And so the linear function is just not going to be able to do that. So it was a bad, bad um, model for this particular type of growth. Okay, so then on your notes, it also asks you to look at a quadratic model. So that was this one here. Again, these are the ones that are best fitting. These are regression equations. These are the ones that best fit the data. And you can see that this quadratic model is just not gonna work. Quadratic models work really great when something changes direction at some point, maybe from like the X value of 10 and on, it's not a horrible fit. Um, but it, again, it's also not going to grow as fast as the exponential function would and therefore not be a good predictor of future values. But then also, if you want to go back a few dates, right? So remember, zero represented February 20th on our Desmos activity. If we go back, 
we want to be able to maybe trace back to when it started or when the first infection was. And this is not going to help us with that because it's going back up again, which does not at all reflect the, the situation, right? We started with zero, one infections, and then eventually grew to this large number. So the quadratic model going up again as X goes negative is just not a good fit. So I'm going to X that one out and then just kind of reiterate this exponential model. The way these functions work when you graph them is they start out with a very slow, gradual growth at first, and then it kicks up and begins to grow exponentially toward the right-hand side. In fact, as you see in these notes, we're going to notice that this function, exponential functions, have horizontal asymptotes, meaning the function will flatten out at the beginning, or it starts off very flat. And as x goes to the negatives, it just gets flatter and flatter, but it's not ever going to dip into the negatives. It will only ever stay above zero, very close to zero, which is a great model for something like this, which, which starts off at small numbers and then just grows exponentially to big numbers. Okay, so here's just a couple things to summarize what we just talked about for the pitfalls of a linear model if you want to jot them down. The linear model had a constant rate of change, and in that constant rate of change, the growth was too slow. And um, on the left side, the graph went negative, which was not a good ref reflector of this type of data. The quadratic model was weird because it went in two directions, right? Down first and then up, kind of looked like this, which did not really represent these data points. The growth was also still too slow on the right side, and on the left it went back up again, which just was not a good reflector of the data. Now what made the expon exponential model the best fit is that it started out slow on the left, right, low, and then it sped up on the right hand side. So the rate of growth was fast enough to model the data. And it also represented varying rates of change. So instead of just going up by the same amount each time, like a line does, it was able to show the slow rate in the beginning and the fast rate toward the end. So I wanted to compare a little bit more the relationship, because there is a similarity between exponential versus linear models. And I kind of wanted to illustrate a little bit what that is so that we can better understand exponential models moving forward. So as we know, a very common type of linear model is y equals mx plus b where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept, or m we could think of is the rate of change, and then b is the initial value or like where it starts on the y-axis. And if you think about it, this is really saying the same thing as this. You start with b, right? When x is 0, when there's no x, y is b. And then when x is 1, you would have 1m. So if x is 1, it'd be 1m plus b. And then if x is 2, there would be 2ms, right? b plus 2m. And then if x was 3, there would be 3ms, and so on. And x would represent, like, the number of times you add m to b. If you think about it that way, because we had talked about before that multiplication is really just repeated addition. So if you multiply m x times, that just means you have x number m's being added together over and over again, a repeated addition. And those are being added to the initial value of b. And so that's why we think of it as a constant rate of change, because every time x goes up by 1, y goes up by m, right? So m was like that constant rate of change because I just add one more m for each x or for each value that x grows. So that's kind of how linear models work. And then if you take a look at exponential, so in our Desmos activity, we learned that this setup is sort of our um, generic exponential model where a represents our starting amount or initial value, initial value, starting amount, and B represents sort of that rate of change or growth rate, growth or decay rate. We'll look at the difference between growth and decay in a bit. So you could also think of this as saying, okay, I'm starting with A, right, my starting number, and then if X is one, I'm gonna multiply by one factor of B. And then if X is two, 
I'm going to multiply by two factors of b. And then if x is 3, b to the third, I would multiply by three factors of b, and so on and so forth, depending on whatever x is. So x here is representing the number of times we multiply b to a. So there is a, a comparison here. There is a comparison. The difference is that exponential is repeated multiplication. Right? It's multiplication versus addition. And then linear is that repeated addition. So the similarity is that it's a repeated operation over and over again. The contrast, the difference is that with linear models, you're repeatedly adding, right? It's repeated addition, whereas with exponential models, you're repeatedly multiplying. But they both begin with a starting value. Um, we usually call that starting value b when we're doing y equals mx plus b. And then with exponentials, it's a, a times b to the x. So we begin with something, some value, some initial value. And then we continue with a repeated operation. So then we add m over and over again, plus m, plus m, plus m, whatever number of times x is. x is just telling us how many times we've added m to b. And then similarly with exponential functions, we do a similar thing with this base b, right? We just multiply that base over and over again a times b times b times b times b, a repeated multiplication of b depending on whatever number x is, right? Whatever number I plug in for x tells me how many times I'm going to multiply my base b to my initial amount a. So that is how they're similar, and sometimes that can help us with graphing exponential functions or just thinking about why the y values change so fast. Because when you're multiplying something over and over again by the same number, that is going to grow very, very fast. Let's say I were to take the number 5 as sort of a starting number and then take b to be 2. And so if I wanted to think of some of the values for 5 times 2 to the x, well, it would kind of start like this. It would start with 5, right, when x is 0. But then when x is 1, it would be 10, right, because I'm doubling it. And then when x is 2, it'd be 20, because I'm multiplying by another 2, right? So it's 5 times 2 times 2, and then I double that, I get 40, right? I double that, I get 80, and so on. And you can see, wow, first the change was only, it went up by 5, because I just doubled 5. But then it went up by 10, right? Because I doubled 10, and then it went up by 20, and then it went up by 40, and then you can see how it goes crazy, <laughs> because multiplying by a common number grows so much faster than adding by a common number. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about the parent exponential function. So by the way, when b changes, the parent function changes. So this function is going to be unique because there's a different parent function for every different b value. So I wanted to take a whole video just to kind of go through the parent functions since they change depending on b. So I'm doing one here that would represent exponential growth where b is greater than 1. So I thought I would do a specific example. Sorry, somehow the multiplication signs didn't come through. I thought I would do a specific example where b is 2 first just to kind of show you the shape and then we'll do a generic example for any b, right? It helps us to see with a specific one first, and then we can go generic. So also for these, I decided to go ahead and let a equal 1 for the parent functions just to focus on how the base affects the shape of the graph. So for all of these, I'm going to just let my starting amount be 1 just to kind of simplify things. So I went ahead and did our typical parent x's where I do a few negatives and a few positives, and they center around 0. So you can kind of see how it kind of centers around the y-axis. And then these are now my exponents, right? So in an exponential function, the x values go up here in the exponent spot. So this would be 1 times 2 to the power of negative 2. And so we have to remember our rules of exponents when we're graphing these functions, that when you raise something to a negative power, it actually 
takes the reciprocal. So then that becomes 1 divided by 2 to the power of 2, 1 over 2 squared, and then that's 1 fourth. And then if I plug in negative 1, that becomes 1 over 2. If I plug in 2 to the 0, that's just equal to 1. That's one of our rules of exponents as well, right? 2 to the power of 0 equals 1. 2 to the first power would be 2, and then 2 to the second power would be 4. So notice that when x is negative, the outputs are just smaller fractions, right? They don't actually turn negative because when you raise a number to a negative power, it does not reduce or it does not turn into a negative. It just takes the reciprocal instead. So let's plot these values out. So negative 2, 1 fourth would be like right here. Negative 1, 1 half would be sort of right there. Um, 0, 1 would be here, 1, 2 would be here, and 2, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 would be right there. So you can kind of see that that sort of crescent moon shape, for lack of a better <laughs> lack of a better term, it's like that crescent moon. Maybe that's what I'll start calling it to help us remember. Think of the crescent moon like this. Um, where on the right-hand side, the x values get really big really fast. But on the left-hand side, they actually get smaller and closer to zero because I'm raising the base to a negative exponent, which is then flipping it over and taking the reciprocal. So that's what happens when b is greater than 1. And this was just an example. 2 is greater than 1, so it's an example of what happens when the base is greater than 1. In general, right, in general, when I take a base b and raise it to a negative 2, I actually flip it over and square it right? So it's a small number. And in general, when I take a general base b to the negative 1 power, you flip it over. This is based on rules of exponents, right? Which cre creates a fraction, which is kind of a smaller number. In general, when you raise a base to a 0 power, you get 1. And then a base raised to the first power equals itself. And then a base raised to the second power is just itself squared. So getting bigger, right? Getting bigger. And I know it's hard to think of things in general terms, but we have to with these functions to kind of understand big picture what's happening. So basically, main idea is this, that when x gets negative, the y value gets small. So maybe I'll write that down. When x gets negative, the y values get smaller. Because instead of the y values turning negative, they're turning into reciprocals and dividing by big numbers, which results in smaller numbers. So for negative x's, the values are getting smaller as you go this way. And then now one point they have in common is at 0. Regardless of whatever the base is, if you raise any base to the power of 0, you get 1. So they'll all have that point 0, 1 in common. And then they get bigger as, as uh, x moves to the right. So I don't know. I'm just going to pick some numbers here some general spots. This will be the point 1 comma b. This will be the point 2 comma b squared. They're bigger as x gets bigger. And so there's sort of our general shape. Specific example when b was 2. General example for any base b that's greater than 1. It'll be bigger on the right, smaller on the left. So when you think about domain, right, the x, what x is allowed to be, x is allowed to be any number because I'm allowed to plug in negatives, I'm allowed to plug in zero, I'm allowed to plug in positives. Also, the graph moves to the left forever and to the right forever. But the range, interestingly, is only ever greater than zero. Even when I plugged in negative x's into these exponential functions, like b raised to a negative number is still greater than 0. It's closer to 0, right? Like when I raised the base of 2 to the power of negative 2, it turned into 1 over 4, which is closer to 0, but still not 0. So the outputs, the y values, actually won't even end up equaling 0. <laughs> They'll only ever be positive numbers. So that's why these graphs are strictly above the x-axis, both of them. The x-intercept is 
there isn't going to be one. And we're, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the y-intercept is always for the parent functions, right? For the parent functions, it's at this point zero comma one, because if you raise any base to the power of zero, it will always equal one. So the parent functions will always hit the y-axis at one. Okay. And by the way, parent functions is when a is equal to one. Now let's talk about this horizontal asymptote. So what's happening here is that there's going to be a horizontal asymptote along the x-axis. And the equation for the x-axis is y equals zero. And the reason for that is because, and it's really only on the left side that this applies to. And what's happening is this. If I raise, so y is equal to a base. I'm going to use two as an example, raised to a power of x. And as x gets more negative, as it approaches negative infinity, which again, this is the left side, my y value approaches zero. It gets closer and closer to zero without hitting it. And here's a couple examples of how that works. I already did negative two, so let's do negative three, negative four, and then I'll jump to negative 10. If I raise two to the x to the negative third power, I end up with one over two cubed, which is one eighth, which is really small. If I raise two to the negative four power, I get one over two to the fourth, which is one over 16, which is even smaller than one over eight, right? And then if I go all the way down to negative 10, one over, or two to the negative 10 would be one over two to the 10th power, I get one over 1,024. <laughs> 1 over 1,024, which is really, really small. Definitely smaller than 1 over 16 and really, really close to 0. So it's kind of like this. As x is moving this way toward the left-hand side, right, we were looking at negative 3, negative 4, and then eventually negative 10, the x values are like barely above the x-axis. In fact, it almost looks like they're touching the x-axis, right? If I were to plot 1 over 8, it would just be like barely right there. And then 1 over 16 would be even closer. And then 1 over 1024, I mean, as a decimal, that is, I don't know, it's, let me see, it's like point zero point zero 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 or no, 0 0.000976, yada, yada. Very tiny, right? Barely. In fact, if you graph it, it almost looks like it's right on zero. So my point is that as x gets more and more negative, the y values get closer and closer and closer to, but never actually hit zero, right? Even though this number is close to zero, it's not technically equal to zero. And so that's what we consider to be this sort of asymptotic behavior when the y value gets closer and closer to something without actually hitting it. And again, this is really only applying to the left side when the x values are getting negative. On the right side, the graph is just shooting up like crazy. So it's not approaching any value. It's going up to infinity. So no asymptote on the right, just the one on the left. So maybe I will dot that in because as we start getting into skill one, you're going to have to locate where that horizontal asymptote is. And I'm going to want you to dot that on your graphs. Okay. Okay. So this is generic parent function for exponential growth when B is greater than one and A is positive. Let's take a look at a similar um, setup where we're doing decay, where the base is a fraction. It's still positive, greater than zero, but it's less than one, okay? Just like with the last one, I'm gonna look at an example with a specific value for B, one half, and then we'll sort of translate to a generic value, any base less than one. Here, I chose the base of one half because it's between zero and one and it's an easy fraction to work with for us to kind of visualize what's going on. Notice I chose the same x's, a few negatives, a few positives centered around zero to get an idea how it works around the y-axis. And then same thing over here for my generic model. So let's plug in a few x's and see what happens. So similar to our last example, 
when you raise a number, even including a fraction to a negative power, you take the reciprocal. So I flip the one half over and I get two, and then I square it and I get four. So that's interesting. My base was small, but when I raise it to a negative, my output is big, bigger anyway than the base. Okay, and then when I take my base of one half and raise it to the power of negative one, it flips. Oops, I didn't flip it. <laughs> it flips to become two, sorry. One half to the negative one would be two, right? The reciprocal of one half. And then one half to the power of zero, like any base, you raise any base to the power of zero and the answer is one. One half to the power of one is just itself. One to the first over two to the first. And then one half squared would be one squared over two squared, which is one over four. So notice as X got bigger, the Y values got smaller. So that's why we call it decay. And this is like, these models are used a lot of times for carbon dating and uh, measuring radioactive decay, right? The decay of certain substances over time tends to follow this sort of exponential decay model. But let's plot these numbers out. So when X was negative two, Y was four. When X was negative one, Y was two. Of course, zero, one is when all bases are when x is zero, base to the zero power is always one, no matter what the base is. When x was one, y was one half, and when x was two, y was one fourth. So it's sort of like a reflection over the y-axis of a growth model, right? Instead of being slow on the right and fast, uh, sorry, slow on the left and fast on the right, it flips over the y-axis and it's like increasing really a lot on the left, but very slow on the right the rate drops and slows down significantly. So that's exponential decay. So that's a specific example, right? When my base was one half. So one half is kind of a good representation of what happens when a base is less than one. So when my base is less than one, I raise it to a negative power. It flips. It gives me the reciprocal, which if the base is a fraction to begin with, then that reciprocal becomes a whole number. So that might confuse you a little bit there. But if base is one half, then one over base is two. So maybe I'll just remind you of that. One over one half is equal to two, All right? It's the reciprocal of one half. So if B is something small, like one half, and I'm doing one over that, that actually becomes big right? Two in this example here, two. And then I had to square it and got four. So that's a big number, right? One over B squared is a big number when B is a fraction, okay? And then B to the negative one is one over B, which would be a whole number, right? When B is a fraction. B to the zero is one. Anything to the zero is one. B to the first is B. But remember, this is a fraction. That's how it's being described here. It's between zero and one. And then B squared would be B squared, which is even smaller because it's a fraction. And when you square a fraction, right, when I squared one half, I got one squared over two squared, which is one over four, which is smaller than one half, right? A base gets smaller when you square it if the base is less than one. So when I plot these numbers out, it looks something like this. I'll just kind of put these generic values down here. But this here would be negative 2, 1 over b squared. That gets really big when b is a fraction. Um, this would be negative 1 and then 1 over b, which again is a big number when b is a fraction. And then these would just be b and b squared, right? That would be 1 comma b and two comma b squared, which are small values when b is between zero and one. Okay, so then this is what an exponential decay model looks like, kind of like a y-axis reflection of an exponential growth. Oh yeah, and I wanted to make a little comment down here that sometimes instead of writing, so, some, so we can think of decay two ways. We can think of it as a times b to the x, where b is a fraction, okay? Or sometimes it's written this way. a times b to the negative x, 
where the base is greater than one, because what happens when you raise a base to the negative power, it flips it over and gives a reciprocal, right? So I just wanted to show you a couple examples just so you can see what I'm talking about. So this would be decay right here because B is less than one, right? But this is also decay because two to the negative X equals one over two to the X. So they're both decay models. But this is just the two different ways of writing them. They're basically equivalent. One half to the X is the same thing as two to the negative X. So sometimes you'll see a base greater than one, but if it's raised to a negative power, it's really a base less than one. Same here, right? This would be decay, not growth, because three to the negative X is equal to one over three to the X, right? And this is decay because one over three is less than one. And then um, these are both considered decay models because 0 0.1 is one over 10, right? So one over 10 to the X, that's equal to 10 to the negative X. So these are both decay models. And then this one is actually a growth. <laughs> Just to kind of show you another example, because if you raise a base that's less than one to a negative power, right? That would be equal to 10 to the X and 10 is greater than one. So that's actually growth. So just kind of be on the lookout. Now in my class, in our notes, I will always use a positive exponent to make things simpler. And so when you're always using a positive exponent, then you can tell if it's growth or decay based on B, whether B is greater than one or less than one. But because you will be going graduating from my class, right, and going to other classes, I want you to be aware of these other ways of writing decay which would be a base greater than one raised to a negative power because that just means take the reciprocal and it makes the base less than one. Okay, so we are about to go ahead and graph some specific examples of y equals a times b to the x, some specific exponential models. So I want you to keep in mind a couple things. So when a is not equal to one, or I guess even when it is, it always represents our starting point, our initial value, right? The value we start with. And then B always represents our growth if it's greater than one or decay if it's less than one rate. Because B is the number that I will repeatedly multiply to A, right? So we're going to kind of be thinking of A times B to the X as A times B times B times B times B, however many times X is. That's how we think about it. So it's a repeated multiplication of B to the starting number A. So let's try a few examples. So here, my A value is two. So that is where we start. Or at least that's the starting point on the Y axis. That's my Y intercept. And then B is three, which is greater than one. So this will represent exponential growth. So let's just go ahead and make a table of values for this particular uh, function. And I'm going to go ahead and go from negative 2 all the way to 2, just so we can kind of see what's happening. So when I plug in negative 2 for x, that means I'm going to do 2 times 1 over 3 squared. Or you can think of that as dividing by three, right? When you go back from zero, zero is kind of the starting point. Um, when you go back from zero using negative exponents, you actually flip the three over, bring it to the denominator, which is actually division. So that would be two over nine, right? Small number. When x is negative one, that becomes two times one over three. So it's kind of like dividing by three one time. Also a small number, but at least it's a little bit bigger than two over nine. Now, when I plug in zero for X, then that means I don't have to multiply by three, right? I have zero factors of three. So that's where my starting value comes in. This is the start, right? I start at a value of two when X is zero. And then when X is one, I multiply by three one time. So I started with two, I multiply by three one time, I get six. And then when I plug in two for X, that means start with two and multiply your base twice, right? Multiply by three two times. So two times three is six, 
times 3 is 18. So maybe I'll just write that here. So these are large, right? As x gets positive, the y values start to grow really fast. In fact, it goes all the way to 18. So maybe I can have my y-axis count by twos. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. 18, I'll go up here. All right. So then I'm going to go ahead and plot these points. When x is negative 2, I have a teeny tiny fraction, 2 ninths. And when x is negative 1, I have a, a small fraction that's not as small, 2 thirds. When I get to 0, I get to my starting point at 2. So let's make a note to ourselves that the y-axis is counting by 2s. So that's the y value of 2. When x is 1, I go up to 6, 2, 4, 6, because I had to multiply my starting value by 3 right? And 2 times 3 is 6. And then I have to multiply that by another 3. So when I go to x is 2, I have to go all the way up to 18. You can see that drastic growth, right? This number is 3 times bigger than that. This is 3 times bigger. That's 3 times bigger. That's 3 times bigger. They're all going up by multiples of 3. And there we go. There's our exponential curve. With a domain of all real numbers, a range that is staying strictly positive, it's got that horizontal asymptote along the x-axis, and the equation for that is y equals 0. This graph is increasing the entire time, and it's not decreasing because it's growth, because 3 was greater than 1. Um, there is no x-intercept, and my y-intercept is 2. Right? Notice it's the a value, because the a will be our starting point or our y-intercept. So let's try one that would be a decay, right, where my base is less than 1. So notice my starting amount is 8. So this is where I start, right? And my growth, or sorry, my decay rate is 1 4, 1 fourth. So basically, I'm going to be multiplying 8 by 1 fourth, however many times x is. Although if x is negative, I actually multiply, right? I'm going to do the reciprocal. So let's make that table of values and see how that works. So this is 8 times 1 fourth raised to the power of x. And I'll do a couple negatives, 0, and a couple positives. In fact, maybe I'll start at 0 to kind of give you an idea of what I mean by start. So when you start at 0, what's happening is you're raising the base, whatever the base is, to 0, which then makes it just turn into 1. So that's why we kind of think of that as our start, our y-intercept, our starting point, okay? Because that's when there is no base of 1 fourth because you raised it to the power of 0. Now, if I move to the right, if I move to the right where x is 1, then you say, okay, I'm going to multiply the base of 1 fourth 1 time to 8. 8 times 1 factor of 1 fourth which is just 8 over 4, which is 2. And then if x is 2, so you move forward one more spot, that just means, okay, well, then you have to multiply my starting amount, 8, by two factors of 1 fourth, or you multiply by 1 fourth twice. So we already did it the first time and got 2, and now we have to multiply by it again. So 2 times 1 fourth is 2 fourths, which is 1 half. So notice... I start at 8, and then I basically just keep dividing by 4 repeatedly. 8 divided by 4 is 2, divided by 4 is 1 half, divided by 4 is 1 eighth, and so on. Now when you go backwards, and you're, multi or you're plugging in a negative exponent, right, to the negative 1 power, well then that sort of does the opposite. <laughs> Instead of multiplying by b, or yeah, instead of multiplying by b, I'm actually going to do the reciprocal of b. Although in this case, b was a fraction. It was 1 fourth. So instead of multiplying by 1 fourth, I'm going to divide by 1 fourth, which is multiply by 4. I'm going to take the reciprocal. I'm going to do the opposite. Instead of doing 8 over 4, it's 8 times 4, and that gets me all the way to 32. And then when I do 8 times 1 fourth to the negative 2, that ends up being 8 times 4 squared, 8 times 16, which gives me 128, which is, I, I can't graph either of those. Those are just way too big. But you get the idea. You start at 0, and moving forward, you just multiply by the base, 
right? Eight times one fourth once, eight times one fourth twice, etc. When you go backwards, you do the opposite. So instead of doing eight times one fourth, I did eight times four once, and then eight times four twice, and then so on and so forth. So that's why, like, for negative x's, decay functions actually have gigantic values, and then for for positive x's, decay functions get smaller and smaller. Right? Eight went to two, went to one half, etc. So let's see. How should we um, uh, do our graph here? Maybe I'll have it go by fours. So this is four, eight. 12, 16, 20, 24, 28. Didn't quite get to 32. Oh, well. Um, so we'll say this is going by fours, but I can still show these three points. When x was zero, y was eight, right? We're going by fours, so that's the second mark. This is four, eight, 12, 16, so on. Maybe I'll label that. And then when x was one, y was two, so that would be like right here because this is four and two is half of that. So it'd be in between zero and four. And then when X was two, Y was one half. So that would be like way down there. And then when X was negative one, it was already like way off the grid. We'll just say like right here. We'll just do that one point and call it a day. Um, but that's the point negative one comma 32. And so this kind of shows our decay graph. And we've got the horizontal asymptote along the X axis because we can see that my Y value won't be zero. I can see my domain is everything, right? I can plug in negatives. I can plug in positives. No big deal. But I can see my range is going to stay positive. My asymptote stays along the X axis. This function is strictly decreasing because it's decay. There's no X intercept, right? These are all parent functions. And my Y intercept is my A value, right? 0, 8 my starting point. So I just showed you a couple of these sort of parent exponential functions, and I'd like you to try a few. I put some funky numbers in there, so feel free to use your calculators. Um, pause your video. I really want you to try these and kind of see what you get. Feel free to label your y, -ax your y axis however you need to to fit your y values on it, and then come back and check your results with my video. Okay, so for number three, we had an A value of 10 and a growth rate of 0 0.5, which since that's less than one indicates decay. So the graph should be doing our crescent moon shape uh, backwards or the other way around the y-axis. Here are the values I got when I plugged in negative two through positive two for x. I got 40, 20, 10, 5, 2.5. Notice the trend, right? They're dividing by 2 each time or multiplying by 0.5. 40 times 0.5 is 20 times 0.5 is 10 times 0.5 is 5 times 0.5 is 2.5. It's a repeated multiplication of the decay rate in this case, which is why the numbers are going down. Because when you multiply by a fraction, you're really dividing by something. In this case, we're dividing by 2. So here were the points when I plotted them out. I went ahead and labeled my y-axis by twos. So I didn't graph the negative two comma 40 point, And then I kind of had to go off my grid to graph the negative one comma 20. So I just sort of labeled that one. And then here were my other points. You can kind of see the curve. The asymptote goes along the x-axis. It does that for all parent functions, right? So this is the domain range and asymptote for all parent functions. And this one was decay, so it was not increasing. It was decreasing the whole time. Uh, no x-intercept and the y-intercept is at 10 because that's when you raise b to the power of 0, which results in 1, right? 0 0.5 to the 0 power is 1. And then a is 10, so then 10 times 1 is 10. Okay, and then for this one, this was similar to our coronavirus model from our Desmos activity, right? Within, it started off with a very slow sort of growth. Um, but it has an A value of 16, sort of a starting number, and then a growth rate of 1.2-ish, right? So you're kind of multiplying A by 1.2 repeatedly. So here were the numbers I got roughly when I uh, just put them in my calculator. So 16 times 1.2 to the negative 2 was 11.1, .1, right? Less than 16 because I'm actually dividing by the base two times. 16 times 1.2 to the negative 1, I got me around 13 and a third, 13.3 repeating. And then when I plugged in 0, of course, you just get A, the A value of 16. 
and then 16 times 1.2 to the first was 19.2, and then 16 times 1.2 squared was around 23. So I went ahead and labeled my y-axis by fives so I could find all of those points. So I had to sort of approximate them, obviously, but they sort of fell right around in here, right? They're all between sort of 10 and 25. So that's where all these points are. And it was a little bit flatter around the beginning, if you remember. So it kind of looks like this. But it will eventually continue to go down to zero. So it still has that horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. It's an increasing function the whole time. So all the way from negative infinity to infinity, it's not decreasing because it's growth. And no, uh, no x-intercept, sorry. And then the y-intercept was at the a value of 16. So this is an introduction, right, to the... Um, more advanced transformations we're going to do in our next video. And so tune in. Those will be tomorrow. See you there.